before another Humboldt squid darted up oh, and this came is right terrible. up to his face. Not his face. Oh, oh my God. No. Oh. And he immediately felt the beak pressed up against no. his face. Oh. opening and closing, trying to bite him. Oh. Hey, bro. Top three places, part 20. Have you guys seen it? Because we haven't. All right, let's jump into it. Today, we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways and survived. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please ask the like button how to get to Bell's Canyon. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Whoa. All right, let's get into today's stories. What the heck is Bell's Canyon? I didn't get the reference. I don't know. Well, now I gotta know. How do you get to Bell's Canyon? Canyon, what is it? What happens there? Why is it ominous? You know what? The fact that the like button is associated with negative things, mm. I don't want to know. That's a good point. Let's put it That's that a good point. I'll just, I'll just let this... This will be one of those... Yeah, yeah. I don't need to know about it anymore. <laughs> yeah. It'll go right over my head. But please, let me know in the comments. What it is. <laughs> In 2019, a 32-year-old United States Army soldier was stationed in Hawaii for training. This was his first time ever being in Hawaii, and so on his first day off, he planned to do some sightseeing. After doing some research, he settled on the Hawaii Volcano National Park as the first place he would go check out. This is one of the top tourist attractions in Hawaii that sees over 2 million yearly visitors. One of the main draws of this particular park is that it's home to one of the world's most active volcanoes, the Kilauea, that has been erupting consistently almost every year since 1983. On the evening of Wednesday, May 1st, wow. John finally was given some time off, and so he hopped in his rental car and he made his way out to the park. When he got there, he was pleasantly surprised to see that it was not crowded in the least, most likely because he was there midweek, and so he paid his entrance fee, and then he started walking up a trail that would bring him up to this overlook that overlooked the caldera. The caldera of a volcano is the actual crater, the inside of the volcano where the actual lava comes out of. At the time John was at the park, the Dude, volcano- you couldn't catch me anywhere near that. You couldn't. I picture the worst thing happening. Well, just, a, just the just day the that ground, you decide yeah, to the go there- the ground crumbles into it and then there's lava everywhere. That's all I picture in that scenario. Yeah, I don't think I would do. I don't think I would walk up there. I think there are like instances where you can take a helicopter and that'd like be, kind of fly over cool, it. Yeah. But I don't know. I've got, I've watched enough like Discovery to see like what volcanoes are capable of. I don't need to see it in person. Yeah. You know, was not actively erupting, and so there was no pool of lava inside of the caldera. However, the surface of the caldera, which was 300 feet below this overlook where John is, the surface was still 2100 degrees Fahrenheit, causing these oh, massive shit. steam clouds Eggs. to billow up from it pretty much constantly. And so when John actually reached this overlook point and was looking out into the caldera, he was immediately disappointed because he <laughs> couldn't see anything. And so as much as John craned his neck to try to get a better look down into the caldera, he was just totally obscured by the steam. Now he was up against a safety railing that prevented people from getting closer, but he figured if he could just get right to the edge of this crater and he could actually look down inside, he might be able to see all- We need a- if this gives me like the- we need to get like a chime or something that's like- Stupid people doing stupid things <laughs> at like, like why the fuck? Do you, why do people keep doing this? Honestly, like, this is so dumb. Like, there's clearly a fence. Like with zoos, with anything, there's a fence. It's there for a reason. Yep. Why are we gonna? Why is it consistently always someone that has to just be like, hey, these rules don't apply to me? Yep. Like, oh gosh. Like, what do? What, what's left? I gotta listen to this. Everything bad that happens to this guy that basically asks for it, I don't know. All the way to the base of the caldera. And so he looked around and noticed there were no <laughs> yeah. other tourists up there with him. So he thought about it for a second and then decided, yep, I'm going to do this. And he stepped over the safety rail. Oh my right God. To the edge of this crater overlooking this caldera. And as soon as he got there, he suddenly had this unencumbered view of the space directly at the bottom of the edge of the cliff. He could actually see down into the caldera now. And so he got his phone out and he started taking some pictures. And then all of a sudden, the ground underneath him began to shift. Look at your worst nightmare. So That's what I'm so saying. Suddenly, that threw him onto his back. And as he's laying on his back, scrambling to get back up again, 
the ground underneath him just completely collapses, sending uh, him careening oh, down oh. 300 feet into the scalding hot caldera. Oh, when John no. fell, another tourist did happen to walk up another nearby trail, and they actually saw him as he fell. And so they called 911, and immediately first responders were on scene, but they were facing the same issue that John was, which is the steam was so intense inside of this volcano that you can't really see down into it. And so they had rescuers walking along the rim of the I mean, volcano. He's a goner. Helicopters in the I mean, like... He just flew in a lava. I don't think he fell into lava. I think the caldera is just like the rim around where the oh. volcano is. So he's just like further into it. Oh. I would imagine it would still be pretty bad for him. Like steam itself can be worse than fire. Didn't he say 2100 degrees? Yeah. He's melted by now, no? Definitely boiling the air but it really wasn't doing any good and in the back of all rescuers minds they knew that realistically there's just no way john could have survived this. that's what i'm yeah. saying you can't survive a 300 foot fall but even if you did you couldn't survive being at the surface of the caldera that's over 2000 degrees fahrenheit you die within a couple of minutes but the rescuers pushed that thought out of their mind and they focused on being positive and just continuing to look for john and two hours into their search, when it was totally dark outside and hope was just about gone at this point, somebody spotted John on a little ledge Holy jutting out 70 feet down shit. from that cliff he was standing on. When he fell, when the ground dissolved underneath him, he managed to land on this tiny little ledge. Had he fallen an inch left, an inch right, an inch forward, he would have tumbled to his death. There's no two ways about it. But he landed perfectly on the one ledge that could have saved oh his life. Oh my God. He was so badly injured, he couldn't climb back up again. However, rescuers were able to rappel down to him, put him in a harness, get him back up, and he was able to make a full recovery. Uh, that's blown my mind. Wow. I, I thought it would be too hot there. No, I guess he's not no, at he's that not all the way super down. hot spot yet. Holy smoke. Like, I think the where the, gar the guards are is just far enough where, like, you don't have to really worry about it as much. But he was like, eh, that's not a good enough view. Walked forward, and that's where the soft, like, cliff Ground. collapsed. Yeah, yeah. But he got so lucky that there was, like, a stable piece of land that uh -huh. was able to hold him. Holy shit. But, ugh. Well, lesson learned, I guess. On July 12, 2015, 30-year-old Christopher Lacun was out on his boat with his wife, his kids, and his best friend Robert just off the coast of Port St. Lucie in Florida. Throughout the day, anytime Chris or Robert were looking down from the boat and spotted a rock pile, they would throw on their scuba tanks and dive down to attempt to find lobsters. Towards the end of the day, when they were looking down into the water, they saw what they thought was a rock pile at first, but as they kept looking at it, they noticed it had lots of straight lines, indicating it could be an underwater building. Chris and Robert noticed there was a yellow buoy floating on the surface right above where this building was underwater and they thought they should probably go over and read it, but they decided, meh, it's inconsequential. <laughs> we can just go down and check it out for ourselves. This very obvious caution sign. Forget yeah. it. <laughs> just like, like, at what point, right? Like, how many lessons? Like, yeah. How many stories do we got to keep hearing about? Like, there was like a sign there, but like, who reads the sign? It's just not, it's not a big deal. It's literally a caution cone right in the ocean. Yeah, it's a caution cone, which means it's my option to read <laughs> yeah. it and then have caution. Like, but it could I don't say want like to. depths of hell underneath this cone, and you'd be like, literally, eh, like guaranteed to chances. die. Eh, you know, like, psh, how many people are guaranteed like, to die? We're all guaranteed to die if you think about yeah. it. Like, get the fuck out oh, of here. Oh, man. Oh, my God. Now, if they had stopped and gone over and read the buoy first, they would have seen there was a warning on it that was telling people to stay back at least 100 feet <laughs> Weird. from this totally. structure. But Robert and Chris didn't read that warning, so they put on their scuba tanks and they dove down into the water. And after only going down about 10 feet, they noticed there wasn't just one. Now, you know what? It's, the, it's actually the person who put the sign-up's fault because they didn't make sure that everybody, like, like... I don't know, like, how else would you warn someone? Like, how many things, like, how many times can you tell someone before they do it? Or, like, put up signs so that people are warned? It's like, man, if it's not, like, directly in your face, how would I know that the sign was there? Like, ugh. 
a structure underwater. There were actually three huge structures. And so Chris and Robert looked at each other and they're totally amazed at what they're looking at. They had been scuba diving together since they were young kids and they'd spent a lot of time in these waters, but they had never seen these before. And so they were very they excited alien. to go down and have a look. When they got down there it's, and they were Honestly, only it's probably just like an oil rig base that we've heard about before. Oh, you know how right. they have stations or something? Maybe. That's my guess. I don't know. A couple feet away from one of these structures, Chris saw that the top of the building was just a square concrete slab. And then on all four sides, there were big concrete slabs. But at the top of each of the four walls of this building were what appeared to be openings. They were almost like windows at the top of the structure. And across the window was mesh all the way around, like a grate protecting things from going into the window and into the structure. And so Chris and Robert went right up to the mesh and tried to look inside of the structure just to see what was in there. But when they looked, it was just too dark inside and there was no way to tell what was in there. And so Chris is really disheartened because he really wanted to know what was inside of this building. And so he just grabs the mesh itself and just kind of tries to tug it in one direction just to see if it would even move to maybe create some space so he could look inside. Oh. And it very easily slid all the way to the side, revealing an opening big enough for he and Robert to go through. And so the two of them look at each other and they just nod because they know they want to go inside and see what's in there. And so Chris went in, followed by Robert, and they found themselves inside of just this big empty space, the 70 foot by 70 foot space where there really was nothing inside of it, except down at the very bottom on one wall was the 16 foot wide opening that was the entrance to a huge tunnel. And from where Chris and Robert were at the top of the inside of the structure, they couldn't see into the tunnel. And so they decided by looking at each other and nodding once more that they would just go down and try to look to see if they could see through to the other side of this tunnel. And so Chris goes down first, followed by Robert. And as they start making their way down, they both start to feel a current that's pulling them straight down. And as soon as they felt that, they Shit. both intuitively knew that they didn't want to be a part of that. And they started swimming as fast as they could back up towards their exit. Robert, who was a little bit higher than Christopher, was able to escape the pull of this current and got up to the top of the inside of the structure towards the exit. Chris, on the other hand, was not able to escape this current's grasp and was actually pulled backwards into the tunnel where he disappeared. Oh, oh Robert no. turned around and saw his... That's like, you know what it reminds me of? It's like, uh, if I was in that situation and I was swimming, right? Mm -hmm. It's almost like watching someone getting pulled by like a ghost. Yeah, yeah. Like, they're just like... You just see them trying to move forward, but they're fall. They're going backwards. Totally. And it's like, mm -hmm. what? What's going on? Like something. It look. It just looks like something's like grabbing them and pulling them. Yeah. But like you're underwater and you can't see currents. Like, oof. That's it's like uh, turbulence. Like you can't see turbulence, but when you when a plane hits it, it yeah. like feels like you're hitting a wall. Yeah. Yeah friend get pulled into that tunnel but he knew there was nothing he could do and so he just turned around swam out of the structure and up to the boat as fast as he could to call 911. once chris had been pulled into this dark tunnel he began tumbling backwards he had no control over his body position the current was just way too strong and so chris instinctively grabbed his mouthpiece and anchored it inside of his mouth and then he grabbed his mask and did his best to keep that on his face because as he was tumbling the current kept trying to pull those things off of him as chris tumbled through this pitch black tunnel, he began to realize that more than likely he's going to encounter some very powerful pump that's sucking this water through this pipe in the first place, or some huge turbine that has something to yeah. do with pulling the water through this pipe. And in both of those situations, once Chris reaches the end of this tunnel, he's going to get cut up and get killed. And so Chris thought about pulling his mouthpiece out to just end it right then and there to avoid this horribly violent death. But he thought about his family, he thought about his kids, and he just couldn't bring himself to do it. And so he just continued to hold on to his mouthpiece and his mask and just continued to tumble with no control in total darkness. You're like, I really hope that my timing is really good because I could be just lucky enough that when the turbines turn in, I go right through right. it. Like there's, but there's a chance, like, so hold on. It's like going through a red light. Like there could be a chance that there's the smallest gap in between the cars that I could go through it. It's like, no bro, <laughs> those are some very slim odds. Having no clue where he was going. 
After over five minutes of this just nightmare situation oh, yeah, with Chris, yeah. he suddenly sees a very small flicker of light at the very far end of the tunnel in the direction they're being pulled towards. And all he can think of is, okay, well, whatever that light is, that's the area where I'm gonna get killed. There's gonna be some pump or some turbine right out there. And so he's bracing himself for this terrible, violent end to his life. But as they got closer and closer and that light continued to grow, Chris got a better picture every time he would tumble around he'd get a look and it did not look like there were spinning blades of death or some pump in there it actually looked like very peaceful calm water with sunlight pushing through. just a natural and current sure enough after yeah. he got shot out into this lit up area the current kind of died down and wow. stopped chris immediately began swimming right up towards the surface where there was actually land right in front of him oh. he was inside of what looked like this huge building and he saw there were people walking around with hard hats what? and so chris just pulled himself out of the water and began yelling for help it would turn out chris had been pulled into a nuclear power plant's cooling system oh. this particular oh. nuclear power plant used a multi-level system where instead of just pulling the water in directly into the plant where it would be cooled and there would be you know, a pump of death or spinning turbines or something like that. Instead, there was a reservoir first where the water was dumped. And then after a while, that reservoir water would then get churned up into the cooling system. So Chris was just incredibly lucky that that was just the way this nuclear power plant was built because many other nuclear power plants, if he had done what he did, he would have been killed in a really horrible way. Chris would ultimately sue the power plant saying they didn't put up enough warning signs or you know, you just got to sit there and you got to be like, if he didn't make it, they'd be like, did you see the sign? I'm curious if he won this lawsuit because. I, yeah, I want to know. Like, I would I would be very interested to know what the outcome of this is. Like, why are you mad? Why yeah. are you mad, bro? Like. You went and did this exploration. It's crazy. It's just like, how did you not like, bro, it could have been in your face. You wouldn't have read it. And then it also, said, it also doesn't sound like the power plant built this like stream that he was in. Like it, it wasn't a man made tunnel. No, nah, nah, you know, with the mesh thing that they pulled aside, you know. Or enough deterrence to protect people from getting sucked into these intake pipes. And the power plant has countered by saying, we put up enough deterrence. You just went past them on purpose. Yeah. As of now, it's unclear what came of that court case. Oh, really? Oh! I need to know. I, I'm my best guess is that he's he lost. That. Literally, like there were at least two things that he just disregarded. It's like I don't know, man. Uh, there's a sign. There was a mesh. Like, I, what else do you need? Yeah. Like, I I don't know, man. Some people, some people just think you need two boobies. Oh, that will that make you read them? Yeah. Like, come on. In 1990, 46-year-old Alex Kerstich was a marine biology high school teacher by day and a documentary filmmaker by night. In July of that year, he and three of his friends were in Mexico working on a documentary about sea life in the Gulf of California. They had already shot a bunch of footage during the daytime, and now they needed to go out and get some nighttime footage as well. On the evening of the 25th, Alex and his three friends boarded a 70-foot research vessel with all of their diving and camera equipment. They waited until just before sunset to leave the harbor and then it was a 30 minute transit to this area just north of La Paz that they had been told was very active at night. Once the ship was stopped they threw their anchor down and then turned on these bright spotlights and aimed them into the water and then one of the ship's crew members put a big piece of tuna onto his fishing rod and then cast it out into the water to try to lure some animals to the area. A few moments later a black mass suddenly came up to the surface oh. ripped the tuna from the line and then vanished as quickly as it appeared. That's my biggest fear when it comes <laughs> to oceans just giant shadows of things i can't <laughs> see just taking things away from the ocean like that would have been my biggest fear in the last story mm -hmm. like i'm swimming down and i see a circle circle square mm. don't want to know what that is okay and then they had the balls to go in and like to the tunnel or whatever well that's like, what i was thinking like what if that buoy said like careful there's a nest of a billion piranhas here like don't get closer, you'll be eaten. And he just didn't read it. No, he, he's, a, he's a piranha whisperer. Yeah. The piranhas would have come at him. He would be like, no, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here for sightseeing purposes. Please don't eat me. 
Alex and his three friends didn't get a good look at it. They saw it happen, but they had no idea what it was. So they told the ship crew member to put another piece of tuna on the line, throw it out there and see if they can get a better look at this thing. And so more tuna was put on the rod. It was cast out. And then seconds later, a black mass rushed up to the surface, grabbed the tuna and then went back down again. But this time with Alex and the others looking really intently at it, they picked up what looked like a red and white flash, like a strobe light on the skin of this creature as it descended down below. Here. And they looked at each other and they thought, could it be? And so another piece of tuna what? was put on the fishing rod. They cast it out into the water. Moby Dick. And this time, before uh. anything could come up and take it, deep down below, they see a flash of red and white all over the place, like a bunch of strobe lights going off. And then dozens of these creatures rocketed to the huh? surface, fought over this tuna, and then descended back down into the deep water. Uh. And so now the men look no. at each other and they're grinning because they know the red and white flashing they are seeing is a trademark of a very rare creature. It's their skin changing colors. It's how they communicate with each other. And this creature is so rare that at this time, no one had actually filmed it alive. There was only footage of it dead after it washed up on shore. And so suddenly Alex and his team are thinking, man, our documentary is about to become legendary if we can just get in there and get the footage. And so the men eagerly put on their dive equipment, got their cameras and prepared to enter the water. Had they consulted with anyone who studied this rare creature, they would have been told that getting in the water with them was a horrible idea oh boy. and could easily get them killed. These I mean, they seem to act very erratic when there's some like food there yeah. like oh let's eat this thing imagine you going in there the like... food's just coming to them yeah <laughs> rare creatures are called humble squids and they are eight oh. foot long apex predators eight foot that long live in the deepest what what you have working knowledge of this creature and you just That's jumped on in and you no, know no, no, there's no, 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 hundreds no, no, of them no, no they didn't have working knowledge he said they knew... if they if they had talked they I... knew what it was well, they heard that it was a rare thing. So They've seen pictures of it dead. They knew it was eight feet long. Well, yeah, but they didn't know what it was capable of. I don't care. Eight feet? Psh, I'm backing away slowly. I don't know parts of the ocean. Because they almost never come up to the shallow waters, we know very little about them. What we do know is that like all other squids, they have eight arms along with two long tentacles that have all these suckers on it. And inside of the suckers are these teeth, Ew. these little daggers that they use to latch onto their prey. And then they pull their prey in towards their center. And at their center is this opening. It's their mouth and it's called a beak. And it literally looks like a bird's beak. It's this hard thing that sits there and opens and shuts and they use it to bite into their prey and then inside of their beak is their tongue and on their tongue are hundreds of sharp little daggers like oh more my teeth fucking that they also god use to dude okay so Holy like shit. basically they're blenders yeah <laughs> they're just they're, blenders basically they're our worst nightmare yeah. okay <laughs> yeah that this is what teeth was based off of yes prey. Typically, these jumbo squid will sneak underneath their prey and then suddenly shoot up, grab them with their two tentacles, and then drag them down to the deeper water where they feel safe. And then they begin the horrifyingly slow process of eating their prey Making a smoothie. because they have a gag yeah. reflex that prevents them from eating quickly. Humboldt squids are very intelligent, they're very social, and they're very aggressive towards humans, especially when they are in a large group or when they are eating. But of course, Alex and his three friends are not thinking about this. They're just eager to get into those jumbo squid infested waters and get this footage. And so they give each other the final okays. They're ready, their equipment's good to go. And they slip off the side of the boat into the water. Once they were in the water, they sank down to 30 feet, at which point they spread out around the squid that were still darting up to the edge of the boat to try to get more tuna. After a few minutes, of Alex and his buddies taking this great footage of these squids, a 14-foot shark suddenly comes into the mix and tries to eat the tuna off the side of the boat. But ironically, on its way out, after not getting any tuna, the shark got its tail fins stuck on the actual hook and then became bait for the humble oh, squids. And seconds later... God. Dude, this is crazy. Are you insane? This is like a series of unfortunate events oh, that continuously God. keep happening. Like, bro, I'm in the water recording these squid. A big ass fucking shark shows up, just Literally. gets in the middle of it, and now shit's gone from bad to worse. This is so insane. How much worse could it get now? Well, 
where these squids began ripping the shark apart. Oh, so Alex God! And his three friends decided to move closer to the drama to get some great footage. As Look Alex at the is right up line. next to this drama unfolding, he feels himself suddenly sinking in the water. And he's kind of fixated on getting the shot, so he's not really worried about why he's sinking. He's thinking, maybe my buoyancy compensator's off, maybe my weights are too heavy. But when he looks down, he realizes in horror, a Humboldt squid has wrapped one of its tentacles around his right swim floor. Oh. So he instinctively begins kicking the squid's tentacle with his left leg. He gets it to release him, and in a panic, Alex begins swimming back up towards the surface. No! But he's still 40 feet away at this point from the boat. And at this point, the other squid had been alerted to Alex as now being considered prey. Oh. And so as Alex is going up, from behind, another squid comes up and wraps its tentacle around oh, his no. neck, and his God. neck was the only area on his body that was not protected by his neoprene wetsuit. And so Ugh. the daggers inside of the suckers uh. on this tentacle dug into his neck all around oh. his neck. So his neck's being cut into and he's being strangled and being pulled down by this squid. And so Alex begins punching and squeezing and pulling on this tentacle, fighting for his life. And he manages to get this squid, the second one, also to release him. But by now, he's been pulled down to 50 feet. Oh, he's got shit. a ways to go to get back to the boat. This is so, this is like, I don't, oh. I, Unfortunately, I, my first question is, did he drop the camera? One, one probably. I would. That means this is all for nothing. Yeah. It is all for nothing, so except hopefully his life is saved. I Dude, know, this I... is like my my biggest fear. I thought we were going to see some footage of this. It would have been awesome. Ugh. And the other squid are all coming over. They're converging on him because they're all fucked. communicating that here's our prey. Here's our other meal. And so Alex tries to swim as fast as he can back to the boat, but he only made it a few feet before another Humboldt squid darted up oh, and this came is right terrible. up to his face. Oh, his face. Oh, no. my God. No. And he immediately felt the beak pressed up against no. his face. Oh. He was opening and closing, trying to bite him. No. And down on his dive mask that was basically saving him from having his skull crushed oh my by the God. squid. Go. The squid became frustrated because it's not digging into Alex's flesh. And so it readjusted its grip on him by sliding down to his midsection. Oh God. Where immediately it begins pulling him down violently in these pulsing bursts. Oh. And so all Alex starts oh. doing is punching and hitting and doing everything oh he can my to God. get this no thing way. off of him. And then for some reason, it does release him. Maybe it was just so frustrated that it could not puncture into him. And so Alex is now down to about 60 feet, and he starts swimming as fast as he can with all these squids all around him. But for some reason, none of them attacked him. And so Alex huh. swims up to the boat, and before he actually gets on board, he looks down back into the water, and there's just dozens of these squids that are flashing red and white at each other, just kind of hovering in the water, not making any move towards him. It was like they were just watching him. Alex sprinted up that ladder, got into the boat, and shortly after, his three friends came out of the water as well. They were unharmed. Alex had deep cuts all around his neck Ugh. from where the tentacles Ugh. had driven their teeth into his throat. But besides that, he was physically okay. Mentally, he was a train wreck and was oh, very one million percent. This event. Never yeah. doing that. Imagine. Yeah. Today, his encounter with the jumbo squids is a thing of legend in the diving community. So that's gonna do it, guys. Oh my god. That's horrible. That is horrible, dude. I just heard the story and whatever I feel like phobia, I gotta talk it through with somebody. Whatever that phobia is, I'm I have it. Oh my! Well, he's. It was titled this section. Yeah, I know. Whatever the phobia was, phobia. I don't fucking. I I have it. I don't uh, fuck with that. That's crazy. That's that's. The I can't believe he survived. The, the squid. They were like, "This dude punches back." Yeah. Don't don't fuck with him. This squid. This, literally, it was like flashing red and white. Yeah. Be like, "Yo, yo, yo! Don't don't mess with this thing." One doesn't taste good. Yeah. Two friggin' that thing hurts. Yeah. They were just watching him like, yeah, yeah, you better. The, no, the, the best part, though, is when he gets the boat and he looks back. I'm yeah. like, why are you looking back? Right. Like, the one thing they tell you when you're running away from something is you don't look back. You keep running mm -hmm. until you keep going until you either you know you're in a safe spot mm -hmm. or you are too exhausted to run anymore. And that's when you can turn around. Yeah. Because at that point, you're too exhausted. You're probably fucked anyway. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. That whole thing was just a horror story and a half for me. Oh, my God. Like, he's the 60 thing. feet. On his face. <laughs> Dude, I mean, but like the, no. the horror of swimming in your 60 feet underwater, you are swimming up and all you see are all of these giant things swimming around you, dude. Nah. Nah. Forget about it. Forget about it. Just the image of like 
the whole thing wrapping like a face sucker yeah. from Alien, trying to gnaw on your face, and you have goggles on, all you see is like, maybe. Dude, fuck off. Forget Are about you, it. Well, it was probably pitch black. Oh, no, they had lights in the ocean. Okay, so maybe you did see some of that. Oh, dude, oh, forget about either it. Either way. Forget about oh, it. Oh, my God. Nah, I'm good. Well, on that note, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you saw, please subscribe. If you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments, and we'll see you in the next one. Yeah, see ya. Bye.